So here we're going to go into systems in more detail. We're going to cover example systems for 1D and 2D, um, looking at audio, DSP, digital signal processing, pet imaging, deep learning as examples, and showing how these can be cascaded or linked to, together to give an overall system. And then we'll uh, briefly review the types of system that we may come across and emphasize a particular simple type of system that we will focus on in this module. So as we know, a system is basically an operator or a mapping that takes some input function here, for example, f of x. Here's the system s with the curly braces showing it's some operator on that input function f of x, and it delivers some mapping, some output function g of x. So it's a function to function mapping. Explicitly as examples then, which we'll get underway with now, uh, we have here for digital signal processing, or, well, this is used in DSP, but really this is an example of uh, spectral analysis, which we will cover later on. But here we're just gonna view this as a system where here on the left-hand side, I've got some speech waveform. I just recorded myself on my mobile phone and uh, just uh, did a little test uh, speech here. And so what we have is the audio signal as a function of time. I just read that into MATLAB. And so really this is a, a discrete um, function. So here I should probably have the square brackets rather than the round brackets. That goes through uh, a system, which in this case is a spectral analysis uh, system, which we will see later on is a, a Fourier transform. Um, so this system here is just showing us the frequency content of that input waveform. And again, we'll cover that at great length. Just for the moment though, we can just say, well, this is telling us, this spectrum is telling us how much of each frequency of each possible sinusoid is contained inside that speech signal. But here, concept of the system is input speech waveform, and we get a spectral function out the other side. And the reason we might do something like that is that we could then easily modify the spectrum of such a signal. So here I'm showing that same spectrum that we saw before for that speech waveform. Um, now I'm running it through a filtering system. So again, this is a very simple uh, algorithm, just a multiplication by some window function. Here all I did was just clip off those high frequencies. And so now I've got this very compact uh, spectral representation where I've just removed those, uh, those other frequencies. And again, we'll get into this later on to the specifics of, of what's going on with spectra and with the Fourier transform. But here, you just need to understand the concept of a system being, for example, a multiplicative filter. So very straightforward. Um, then we could have another system, and this one might um, uh, be doing uh, the recovery of a speech waveform from a given spectrum. So if here we give it the uh, filtered spectrum with those high frequency components removed, run it through uh, a system now, which is gonna be the inverse Fourier transform, which we will cover at length later on, to now have an output signal, which is the filtered speech waveform. And so that would be something that's audible, that we could recognize as a voice, but with uh, variations in the frequency content. So you can have all kinds of funny effects that you can do with, uh, with audio signals, with music, with uh, speech, uh, by doing filtering in the, in the frequency domain. And so we could cascade those together, and that's what I'm showing here. We've got some speech waveform, some 1D function coming in on the left-hand side. Incidentally, the reason you see two colors here, uh, it took me a, a brief moment to realize this myself, was when I recorded myself, I've actually got stereo, a stereo microphone on the uh, mobile phone. And so the, this is a two channel recording. So we've got the kind of left and right uh, waveform here. Um, so that uh, speech waveform goes into a spectral analysis uh, system, which then gives us, so at this point we now have the spectrum. We can then have another system that does the filtering. So that's now removed some of those uh, uh, frequency components. And then we can do uh, the reverse of the analysis and now synthesize a waveform from those frequency components. And so basically we've gone from this regular speech waveform to this rather odd sounding speech waveform by cascading 
or, or joining together in series um, three different systems. Uh, another example in the context of DSP uh, would be if we did a, a microphone um, recording here. Um, and then really we're going to need to convert um, the analog signal, um, if you like, the, the, the pressure variations uh, from the sound, um, giving, which give an analog signal. We need to convert those to a digital signal, and that's how we even get that waveform that I showed earlier. And incidentally, um, in fact that's the point of this slide I'm showing here, um, in that short uh, sequence, I had about half a million samples. And so in MATLAB, that, that was stored in double precision for two channels. I was dealing with eight megabytes of data. So that's quite large for what was a very brief sentence. And so that's why uh, systems can be used in this way to, uh, for example, compress signals. And so my phone delivered this .m4a file, which uh, corresponds to what's known as an advanced audio coding uh, method, and that's an AAC encoder, which means that this signal can be compressed, in other words, converted to another signal, um, to one that's only about 2.5% the original size. So this, this uh, speech waveform is only stored as a 210k uh, file. Um, and so this system is compressing. It's taking an input signal here, and delivering a very compact signal, which is great for storage, for example. You don't want to take up megabytes of space for just short uh, audio sequences. And then when you want to come to use that um, information again, we can run it through another system, a decoder, which will take the, the compressed waveform and then expand it back out to its full uh, sampling um, level that we saw before. And then, of course, that would ultimately run through some digital to analog converter to, to effectively uh, be audible through speakers, for example. So the point here is that we've got, again, a cascade of different systems doing different tasks. And really, we're free to consider the whole thing as a system or any particular section as a system. The point being, we've got a, a function going in and a function coming out from a system. So back to one of my favorite examples, medical imaging. Here, if we uh, acquired data um, in the PET imaging context, here I've got a simulation of a sagittal section um, through a human brain mimicking a fluorodeoxyglucose update, um, uptake. And so this would be an input signal um, FXY. I'm trying to pretend that's a continuous uh, XY sampling. So try and ignore any pixelation there. It runs through the PET scanner, which then delivers this discrete uh, measurement, uh, this so-called sinogram, not the topic of this uh, module. So all you need to understand is it's just a measured 2D signal. So I've got some uh, count values P that vary with coordinate S and coordinate phi. And so we've got the system here being the PET scanner, which is just some operator on this continuous function, which was the distribution in the brain giving us some discrete measured output function, P, S, of S and phi. And then that discrete uh, data could then, is of course a, a 2D signal, 2D function. That can go through another system. Here that would be a reconstruction algorithm. So in the previous example, it was a uh, you know, million, two million pounds worth hardware that we were capturing as a mathematical system. Now it's just uh, an algorithm on a computer which is then delivering um, a, a reconstruction from that uh, data. And here the data were actually very count limited and so my reconstruction quality is quite poor, uh, which is why with the wonders of deep learning, convolutional neural networks, for example, we could use another system such as a deep network, a deep architecture, and denoise that signal to get uh, an improved signal output here. Again, the, context, the, the, the concept being we've got some system, here I'm calling it some operator K, which operates on some input function to give some output function. And incidentally, as I mentioned here, this is mimicking or representative of what's called a convolutional neural network. And one of the core components of this module will be to understand just the building block of a CNN, which is called a uh, convolution operation. It's actually a very, very simple concept. And so I hope uh, during this module, you'll also be convinced about how straightforward convolution is. 
And when you've understood convolution, if you want to go into AI deep learning, then that will help you immensely. And just like with the audio DSP case, uh, likewise with PET imaging, we can cascade these systems. So we've got the, the true distribution of activity in the human brain that goes into the, the PET scanner hardware. That's the expensive equipment there, delivering us some measurement which then goes into our software, our reconstruction algorithm, uh, which we may not be happy with. It could be quite a noisy result. And so we can run that through some kind of image processing methodology. You know, it could be as trivial as a convolution to do a smoothing or a little bit more advanced like guided smoothing, or as I'm trying to represent here, a very advanced uh, deep learning method where you've learned from many training data sets how to best denoise a pet image. Um, and again, giving a, a further block there, a further system to cascade. We could then even have a, some kind of diagnostic uh, system where you put a signal in, and here the signal is the processed image. And this diagnostic system would then, for example, could just give a simple value of one or zero. So it just has one independent variable, um, or rather the independent variable that's supplied to it is in fact a whole function, of course, but then the output um, is a signal which has just one independent variable, in other words, just uh, one uh, value for, for one given input. So it would say one for healthy, zero for unhealthy, just as an example. The point being, we've got a whole chain of systems, a whole chain of different functions at each stage. Um, so picking up more on that neural network example, uh, just to show, uh, this is a well-known example from 2018, got published in Nature, so it had quite a lot of impact, where you could use a system, um, in this context a deep network, to go from measured MR data to go to a reconstructed MR image. Um, and so here they were showing by using um, all of these so-called layers, and by the way, all the layers in an artificial neural network or convolutional neural network are themselves uh, systems. So we've got, a, in fact, a cascade of systems, even in describing um, you know, state-of-the-art convolutional neural networks. Um, and they showed that by doing that, you can actually get improved reconstruction quality compared to conventional uh, reconstruction methods. And, of course, in PET, we've done a similar kind of thing here where we've got the input signal 2D uh, function goes through a whole series, a massive cascade, if you like, of layers of different convolutional operators uh, to deliver some reconstructed output. And then one more example on, um, of a very general system, again from deep learning to try and really motivate you to understand signals and systems uh, from a very basic starting point. Um, here, uh, you can supply a random signal of, uh, you know, this could have maybe, I, I can't count there, maybe a hundred different values there, different random values. And you could put that as an input signal, a 1D input signal, into what's called a generator, which is just another example of a system, um, to generate an example image output. And so what's so amazing about these so-called deep generative models is that you can just randomly sample this 1D um, function, which is very easy to do in MATLAB. You just randomly pick 100 numbers, for example. You supply that simple 1D signal to this generator, which, by the way, would be composed of a whole cascade of different layers doing various processing. And when you run it through, it would give a, a unique brain corresponding to the random set of samples in the input signal. So this is a wonderful way of uh, generating novel samples um, from, from distributions. And, and this has actually been done in practice. For example, you can train these generators on artwork and generate entirely new, never before seen pieces of artwork. And so this is an example of what's called a, a generative adversarial network uh, made famous by its inventor, Ian Goodfellow from a few years back now. But the point being, it's a system. You put a signal in, through the system, you get a signal out the other side. That's the key point. And the system here is just some operator G operating on that 1D signal to give um, this brain image output in this example. And there I'm just showing uh, a few random brain images that could be uh, generated by putting different random values into that 
system. Uh, here I'm just pointing out there are all kinds of different possibilities for systems. Um, we've talked before about continuous domains and discrete domains. In other words, do we have continuous values um, to supply to these functions or do we have discrete values? So that's what I'm showing here in the input and output, describing them as continuous functions or discrete functions and the dimensions involved. And so um, that's the CC here. For example, that would be it's a continuous to continuous mapping. And I'm giving you an example here of, of that we will cover, what we haven't covered yet, a convolution integral, Fourier transform. These are convolution, these are continuous to continuous mappings. Um, we could have, for example, continuous to discrete. Um, as an example. So there, that would be like a, a camera, an imaging device where you're dealing with the continuous function of the uh, object that you're looking at in real life, runs through your system, the camera that you're using, and you'll get, say, a 10 megapixel image out the other side. That's a discrete function. So that's a continuous to discrete mapping. The pure mathematics tends to be continuous to continuous. Um, the hardware tends to be continuous to discrete, and algorithms like DSP or deep learning networks tend to be discrete to discrete because you've already got the function stored um, in an array in memory, so it's a discrete function running through an algorithm to deliver another discrete function. But really, what I want to point out on this slide is that in this module, we're going to focus on a particular type of system which we're going to be calling linear and also shift invariant. So those terms will be explained at length later on. But just to point out in this slide, many possibilities exist. We could have linear systems, nonlinear systems, continuous to continuous, discrete to continuous, continuous to discrete, and so on. Um, but really, here we want to focus on a particular type called linear shift invariant for spatial uh, variables or a linear time invariant for temporal variables. And if you can just understand um, the so-called linear shift invariant or linear time invariant systems, this will put you in a very strong position, in fact, for understanding most of these other systems. Because once you've got the, the foundations in place, you, you, can really, you really will be set up for, for following far more complicated mappings. So uh, to summarize then, um, signals or functions and systems, as we've seen, are virtually everywhere in science, technology, engineering. So we've really got to study these. And what we'll be doing is really associating mathematics to these concepts that we've been illustrating. Um, here we'll be focusing on so-called linear systems, which I'll explain at length. Um, but really, linear systems are ones that do what you expect them to do. In, in essence, if you um, double, if you put in two inputs, um, then the, the, the output is the sum of the two separate outputs you would have got from those two inputs if dealt with separately. But we'll go into that in detail later on. Not to worry for the moment, just bear that in mind. We're going to be dealing with linear systems and time invariant ones. In other words, they don't change according to where you are in time. Um, we're also going to be uh, considering uh, the Fourier transform because that um, gives us an alternative representation of signals that will be extremely useful um, in our analysis and in our processing. And as I've mentioned a number of times, understanding these concepts is really going to help you um, in a more general context for understanding more difficult um, systems. And uh, as I put at the bottom of the slide here, you know, a really key concept is going to be understanding how we express these signals or functions um, as summations of very simple functions. So this is going to be a core concept that, that we can understand a system very well if we put in a very simple function. Okay, simple function into a system equals simple function out the other side that we can understand. So when we've got these more complicated signals, if we describe those complicated signals um, in terms of simple signals, then suddenly you can see that we're going to be able to understand in a very straightforward way what's going on with general signals by understanding what goes on with their separate constituent parts. So here's the, uh, the review slide. Uh, we've just covered you know, what is a system, given you a few examples for 1D and 2D, talked about cascading them, and then considered the various types of system. So thank you for listening.